even you said that in public uh, space, you cannot apply your, the same design language in the residential program, but we could still see it from that the space, light, the waters to reflect the old part of the architecture, we could still see the key icon design elements from your side. And uh, we would like to know that in the Singapore Art Museum, you use, the, you, you actually, to preserve this old architects and to develop a new one to run it. And we can see it's quite modern and simplicity. And you also be influenced a lot by the classic architecture. So our question would be that in between old and new, and what do you think that you could carry on from the classic architecture and to apply it into the modern times, into the modern design? Yes, it's a good observation. Uh, even though the introduction looks like they are very contemporary modern buildings, I'm very aware of the strength that classical architecture can bring to the table. Uh, when I was a student, I, I, I toured Europe and looked at monuments. I looked at palaces, um, Asian palaces, Indian palaces. I realized the power of symmetry, the power of exterior courtyards. Um, but most of all, I understood that classical architecture was about procession. It's about designing sequentially, allowing people to go from space to space and be able to choreograph the experience of each part of the journey. That means design thinking about the human body, thinking about the experience of light, space, air. So even though it's an institutional building and the scale is much larger, that lesson of classical architecture, the strength that it brings, the ability to bring emotional response is never lost. It stays within what I designed. So the emotional response is uh, where actually, uh, how you define or how you confirm your uh, standing point of to respond to people's emotional and uh, where, it, where is it from? Like you have so many projects going on and you got different inspirations from the surrounding, from your grown up or from your education background? I think uh, when, you, when, when you are sensitive and you can absorb the environment, you realize that certain types of spaces evoke certain responses. And that certain types of design, for example, will make you more aware of textures or connection to nature. So when you want to design an architecture that is phenomenological, that means an architecture that is able to evoke emotions. You have to think of sight, you have to think of sound, you have to think of smell, textures, and you think of certain aspect of time as well. So in a lot of my design, I bring in elements of water, uh, sometimes darkness, sometimes light, sometimes spaces are small, sometimes spaces are tall. So all those are devices that you can use smooth versus rough, nature versus uh, manufactured. So I think it's not one clear answer. Sure. And uh, you're also talking about uh, that part of your observation is from the, like, uh, is from the temple, from the local culture, and to connecting the project with the local mm -hmm. culture. And it's very important to preserve the lifestyle and culture is part of it. And could you elaborate this part more? I think there, there are a couple aspects to this. When you design in a particular place, uh, especially in certain types of projects, cultural projects, or even resort projects, you have to draw upon the, the essence of each place. When you are doing buildings in city centers, it's harder because it tends to be high rise. But you have to understand that people experience space differently. For example, in the Western culture, buildings like the Pantheon, the Parthenon, classical buildings are very heavy and inward looking. In Eastern uh, buildings, the construction could be wood. Um, they could be centered more around courtyards. So again, the feeling is very different. For example, in the, the Summer Palace, in Japan for the, 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 the king, uh, it's a very modest building. And then you go to the imperial 
Palace of Forbidden City. You know, again, you 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 understand that the idea of the concept of hierarchy is important. So it's very important to understand history. So uh, talking about to actually to responding to the nature of the culture of the city, and we would like to know that uh, in your country project, now how you respond to the local culture there and what kind of the spirit you would like to deliver? I think in that particular project, I was, I was looking at more an expression of spaces that can be used for multi general living. Um, and of course, taking on considerations of the site and the view and creating an environment that's very suitable for dwelling. So the cultural element is not as strong. I refer back a bit more to the Chinese culture, but in terms of the architecture, it's still quite universal. So it becomes the argument of should every building in a different place look like it's from that place? Yes. And sometimes you can't do that because today, high-rise building depends on technology, depends on certain types of construction method. So while the world is becoming more homogeneous and more universal, we can still hold on to parts of something that's unique to each place. Other building types like museums, resorts, and then would you think that uh, in China that what kind of the biggest challenge that you would ever met when you apply your practice? I understand developers needs and usually when I start a project I come up with ideas but as ideas becomes developed and I work with um, market forces I realize that in China the approach of developers is quite singular and this is my message to all developers if they are listening, because there's a balance between, for example, organizing your whole building around views, that every unit must have a view versus um, composing a scheme around views, but sacrificing a few units to have a very strong concept. So what would be, uh, what do you think that in China, the future, the, the tendency or the trends for the project would be? and what the design should be, what part should be emphasizing for the design in China? The architecture quality in China is so high. <clears throat> the capability of uh, craft and manufacturing is so high because China has the skill to make things. And I think uh, China will, will come up with its own direction because right now, uh, it's quite universal, but I could see every project that I'm doing, the requirements are getting higher, clients are getting more demanding, and all our partners and consultants have a very high skill. So I'm quite sure that in due course, the, the kind of work that comes out of China will be unique. It's going into an era that's going to be leading in terms of the design, and they're going to be able to integrate a lot of technology into these buildings. So it's an exciting time for China, I think. And I'm actually start, started to pick questions from the audience. So one of the questions would, is that actually about the Surrey Highland projects, when architects or designers become a developer. So how could you unify or to fulfill the design cost and a commercial value in one project? A good question. To be honest, uh, I'm definitely uh, veering to the side of a designer. It's less of a development. I think in that project, I, I did go over budget because I wanted to be very clear in what I want to do. And even today, not all units are fully sold. Uh, but I think by being, I believe that by being true to the project, and if the project is small enough, like in this case, only 31 units, you can take that risk. It's a boutique project. But if you start to go into a thousand units, you have to think differently. I do not see a conflict as a designer and developer because basically I'm a developer so that I can have more flexibility to design. That's why I'm not going to do another development project. That's probably the last one. I realized how difficult development work is and how challenging it can be. 
to be a developer, you need to have a lot of considerations, ability to understand legal, contract, finance, branding, marketing, project management. I think development is one of the hardest things you can do and the most satisfying thing you can do. What would, should be the key factors mm. that you should, you should consider when you're processing the urban luxury residential projects? I think high density project in some ways are very ecological and sustainable, but it needs strong master planning. It needs the involvement of the city. That's why social housing can work. Because when you put a lot of people together in dense areas, you must provide amenities so that within each block, you have your own dry cleaners, your own grocery. You can actually eliminate cars. So high density housing is a viable proposal. But of course, today with the global situation and pandemic, people start to imagine that they want to move away from high density housing because people are concerned about infection rates. People want to move to the suburbs. But I do believe that that is temporary. Uh, there are some people that will want to live in the suburbs with the family and other people they want to live in high density housing. The key to successful high density housing is infrastructure, public transport, all these other factors and policies, you know, strong governmental policies and healthcare. So that's become, uh, it's really depending on the policies you could actually to fulfill your design philosophy here in China for the multi-generation space and the modeling, the icon iconic modeling type to be applied here in China. And now we come to, and you keep mentioning about the sustainability and sustainability is a very nature thing to you and to be emphasized most in all your projects. And you also have said before that architecture itself, meaning that beyond sustainability. So at the occasion of 25th year anniversary of SCDA, and also at this pandemic period, do you ask yourself, yeah, what do you work for or what do you design for? What would you, what actually it bring to you for your design in the future? I think in some ways, every practice when you, when you are successful, you build a lot, you tend to get into a situation where you are repeating yourself. And we, are, we realize that whatever we have done so far, we need to change. And the pandemic has forced a change because everybody in the world has slowed down and we consider why, what life means, the fragility of life. And I believe this pandemic will allow us to think of it differently with our developers and our collaborators. For SCDA, we are committed to change. We take this opportunity to say we want to change, but we know that changing ourselves is difficult. So we collaborate. For example, we, are, we have an agreement now to collaborate with uh, environmental group Palais for the Oceans from New York. They are a very strong group uh, that advocates for ocean conservation and material research. What we don't have at SCDA, we have to collaborate with people. And tomorrow, for example, I have another webinar that's totally different. It's about the intersection of well-being and sustainability. So all these other peripheral aspects indirectly will make us change in our design, but it's going to take time. I don't think it's an issue of pandemic comes, designers get together in a forum and discuss, and within a year or two, they design differently. I think the evolution will be gradual because we're going to have to respond to our clients' needs that are changing. And designers need time to, to, to respond to. It's an existential question, larger than a designer could comprehend. You, uh, you actually mentioned about uh, your uh, support of the foundation for the ocean uh, of the preservation. And uh, we would like to know that you have also your hotel to actually to support this fund, and which project actually is the most uh, representative project among all your designs? Would you choose one from it? Uh, definitely Suri Bali, which I, I, I have spoken about because 
that project uh, is a different kind of project in a, in a place with, with actual community. So we're able to do a lot of things there. So our collaboration with Parley for the Oceans really is to help them design an ocean research center in Maldives, in the middle of nowhere. So we have to think about how to be self-sustainable in the island. And we will work with their partners who are scientists and manufacturers. We hope that that lesson learned from that can be applied to the second ocean research center in my hotel in Sri Bali. Sri Bali is a hotel that, that not only do I design, but I'm running it. And it has programs, programs that are beyond architecture, like wildlife conservation, like turtle conservation, cultural preservation, all these other aspects. So a lot of things that you can do is beyond architecture. It's outside of architecture. Architecture can't solve the world's problems. And uh, there is a question from our audience. Let me to check it. Could you please tell me that SECD's works are almost square boxes with constitutes of the space, which is completely different from the surface representative design from Zaha. Is it because the difference in personal style, style or the square, the volume tricks in people's experience? Yes, um, I think uh, there are many approaches to architecture. And over the years, many famous architects have expressed themselves, like Frank Gehry, or Kup Himmelblau, or Zaha Hadid. So that's a sculptural approach. My approach of the boxes is not exactly that they are a signature piece that I use. It's just that it's the most efficient, economical, baseline of architecture. And a lot of times these boxes are arranged for a reason. The boxes themselves are not important, but the spaces created in between the boxes are more important. So when you have a box and you arrange them in a certain way, you create a courtyard, you create a garden, you create a sense of center. So for me, the void is as important. So by using a rectangular box, you become more generic. The other approach, of course, when you do a memorial or a museum, you can afford to be exuberant, you can afford to be sculptural because it's a standalone building. It's not part of the urban fabric. So it's just a question of uh, different approaches to design. They're all valid. Uh, yeah. In design, what's, what's your understanding of home? Well, I would say home is the most important part of design. If I had to start a, a young architect in a practice, I say design a house. Because house, design a house makes you understand the rhythm of life. Sleeping, eating, socializing. Starting, for example, with a shopping mall is harder. So I think the idea of home is central to architecture. Ask any young child what home is and they will draw you a very simple sketch that represents warmth and security and family. So the house is the best design, I still think, no, ma no matter what the scale is. Uh, actually, a last question. It says that in, as the benchmark work of Kanchao in 2020, you adopt a minute list aesthetics and to integrate it into human life. Do you think that beauty and comfort could coexisting at the same time in this work? I think there are two parts to the answer. One part is, uh, uh, is about structure and architecture. So when you make structure of beautiful proportions, it actually doesn't need much embellishment. The second part is, what is beauty? Is beauty subjective? But I happen to believe that there's a universal standard of beauty. Some people think beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I think universally we can agree when you see something is beautiful. And it's beautiful because it's well proportioned and well made. And I think that's what we try to bring into that project. Less important stylistically, but more about the structure of the space.
she would like to uh, make a summary for our today's discussion. Jessica. 下做一个总结，就是其实我们为了这次直播前后进行了两次的排练。嗯，然后，然后，并且还有就是曾先生为这次的这个直播准备了一个非常非常详细的这个架构，所以我我其实要特别感谢他，因为我我看到的不仅仅是一个建筑师他的对设计的创新，他的这个呃带领团队要做全世界最好的项目，另外呢，我看到了他其实对于一份职业的这种呃尊重。Thank you for inviting me.